The Teaching of the Master, Part 2, Chapter 7, Standing Before the King, Matthew 5, Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The qualities which make up the character of the disciple grow from stage to stage, and the order in which the blessings are given reveals a relationship between them. It is those who have been humbled from outside themselves by the training of life who develop meekness as an inward grace. Meekness is selfless. From it there springs a reaching out to that which is beyond ourselves, a hunger and thirst after righteousness. In loving kindness these qualities are fused into unity and warmth, and at that level the disciple may attain the purity of a heart at one with itself. From purity comes an inward peace which flows out into his communion with others. The Lord's words in Matthew 5 verse 8 agree with the Septuagint of Psalm 24 verse 4, the only place in the version where the exact Greek expression occurs. Here David declares that the man who will stand in the Lord's holy place is he that hath clean, that is, innocent, hands, and a pure heart, a heart at once choice and clear, as the same word is rendered in two successive verses in the Song of Solomon. It has been said that of the Hebrew words denoting purity, this adjective is the least tinged with the idea of ceremonial uncleanness, and it is used in an ethical sense also in Job 11 verse 4 and Psalm 19 verse 9. It only occurs seven times altogether. The words which Jesus quotes derive their force from their place in the thought of the psalm as a whole. It is a poetic meditation on the principle that the Lord will be sanctified in them that come near him, and before all the people will he be glorified. And from this follows the conclusion that the earth will ultimately be filled with his glory. This is a faith of which the ground is to be found in God's creative power, who will prove to have an abiding place at the heart of God's purpose. Will it not be those who sanctify him by their clean hands and a pure heart. But now comes a remarkable step in the thought, for the blessing which that man will receive from the Lord will be righteousness from the God of his salvation. Without attempting to impute to the word salvation all the meaning it gathers from the New Testament, it is still a striking fact that this man of seemingly flawless character needs to have righteousness ascribed to him or declared by the graciousness of God. The same truth is implied in the fact that the spiritual race, the generation of the true Israel, of which this man is a type, are called seekers after God. This, says the psalmist, is the generation of them that seek thee, that seek thy face. And they are the true seed of Jacob. Jesus lays hold of the words and carries the thought to its conclusion. He says that to those who knock it shall be opened, those who ask shall receive, the pure in heart shall find God whom they seek. Nor is the seeking theirs alone. God, who is spirit, seeks them to worship him in spirit and in truth. But Psalm 24, verse 4, is not the only passage to which the Lord's saying may bear an allusion. The same phrase occurs once again, and only once, in Psalm 73, verse 1, which the Revised Version renders, Surely God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. 
This is the conclusion of Asaph after wrestling with the problem of the prosperity of the arrogant, which had proved so great a stumbling block that his feet were almost gone. And the point is that only the pure in heart can perceive the purity of God which is revealed in his ultimate dealings with man. For as David said, and again a cognate word is used, with the pure thou wilt show thyself pure. At this point we reach the centre of the Master's teaching. A pure life can only come from a pure heart, just as good fruit can only grow on a sound tree. Only if the heart is whole and clean will life be lived constantly as in the sight of God, because no other heart can hold the strong desire to know or be known by Him. Without the woven vesture of a pure life, no man is fitly clothed to enter the royal presence, or he will find himself like the man at the marriage feast without a wedding garment. In this saying, Jesus joins issue finally with the interpretation of righteousness, which made it a matter of outward acts punctiliously performed. Unless the acts express the heart, they are rotten fruit from a corrupt tree, and however pleasing they may look in skin or texture, they will prove rotten when they are put to the test. Only twice afterwards in the New Testament do we find the expression a pure heart, and both are in Paul's letter to Timothy. In the first of Timothy, chapter 1, verse 3 to 5, the apostle commissions Timothy to charge some that they teach no other doctrine, and goes on to explain the object for which such a charge is given. The end of the charge is love out of a pure heart of a good conscience, of faith unfeigned. In the second of Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, he exhorts, Follow after righteousness, faith, love, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. In the last especially we cannot fail to see an allusion to the sermon, and we can scarcely add it to the Apostle's exposition of what purity of heart means. These are thy servants which stand continually before thee, said the Queen of Sheba to Solomon. It was reckoned the great privilege of the seven princes of Persia and Media that they saw the king's face. David can apply to the Lord this language of oriental court etiquette and say, The upright shall behold his face. And so in the language of Jesus, the promise that the pure in heart shall see God implies also seeing his kingdom, for they will see him enthroned in rule. To see the king means to be accepted in his presence, and for frail human nature that is impossible without reconciliation. Job, in the most sublime utterance of his faith, declares that God himself will at the last act the part of his kinsman, and will vindicate him, rising up in judgment over the dust of the grave. And in that day, says Job, from my flesh shall I see God then God will no longer seem to be his adversary. Job's assurance that his eyes shall behold God is the assurance also that they will be at one. It is in this sense that Elihu takes up the expression when he says that, If there be a messenger, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to declare unto man God's uprightness, then God will say, I have found a ransom, and part of the restoration of the suffering man is that he shall see God's face with joy. Later in the New Testament, Christ's expression is expended in two notable ways. 
First, him whom they are to see enthroned is God manifest in his Son. Paul has an undoubted allusion to the sermon, for reasons which will be even more apparent when we consider the next saying, in Hebrews 12 verse 14, Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. What Lord? This letter has already spoken of Jesus as Lord. May we not conclude that the Lord whom they shall see is the Son who is the brightness of God's glory when he is enthroned in power? In Revelation 22 verse 4, the very words of Esther chapter 1 verse 14 and Psalm 11 verse 7 are used in reference to the throne of God and of the Lamb when it is said, His servants shall do him service, and they shall see his face. Whose face shall they see? The occupant of the throne, who is God manifest in the Lamb. And John says of the Lamb, We know that when he is manifested, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The other direction in which the idea is expanded is that to see God is not only a future blessing. The pure in heart have even in the days of their flesh a knowledge of him denied to others. The thought is brought out by contrast in the first of Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 5, where the impure heart results from ignorance of God and excludes knowledge of him not in the passion of lust, even as the Gentiles which know not God. But in this channel of thought also we are led back to God's manifestation. If disciples can even now see God, it is because they see his reflection in Christ, and because in Christ the veil which interposed for the Israelites is done away. We all, with open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are transformed into the same image from glory to glory. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God shines in the face of Jesus Christ. Part 2, Chapter 8, The Sons of God, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Peace is the product of that transformation which is referred to at the end of the last chapter. It is a peace coming from the wisdom which is from above, for it has its origin in the Father of lights, from whom all good gifts come. He recognises as his sons those who reflect his character as it is revealed in Christ by being not merely peaceable, but makers of peace. For Paul is appealing to a principle in the Father's nature when he says, God is not the author of tumult, but of peace. The God of peace begets children of peace, whose actions are peace. Synonyms, which may often be interchangeable, can at will be distinguished by a particular nuance of meaning. Two Greek words, which may be represented respectively by son and child, and afford an example. John can convey a special tenderness by writing to the believers as little children, and he emphasises their dependence on the Father when he said, Beloved, now are we children of God. But the term son, while it maintains to the full the bond with the father, at the same time defines the son as an individual with a standing and character of his own. And he is all the more recognisable as an individual by the very fact of likeness to his father. The God of peace is a favourite expression of Paul's. 
So also is the Hebraic expression sons of God, often in the sense of moral kinship as well as of adoption through forgiveness of sins. Light is thrown on the thought in the saying by Isaiah 58, where the house of Jacob are reproached for being the opposite of peacemakers, for they fast for strife and contention, and hence they do not fast so as to make their voice to be heard on high. But if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in darkness, and thine obscurity be as the noonday. Here is the antithesis to strife. The true fast for which God calls is the life of mercy out of a pure heart which brings peace. A peace which is not merely the absence of contention, but a positive upbuilding in love. For the result to which it leads with God's blessing is restoration, rebuilding. They that be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. The repairer of the breach, what better synonym for a peacemaker? If the tabernacles of David, which have fallen, are to be raised again, so as never to fall, their foundation must be more than stone. They must rest on lives filled with loving kindness, and their pillars must be set in spiritual peace. And the message of Isaiah is surely that it is not God alone who makes the peace of the kingdom. It is men whose lives have been peace who repair the breach. The peacemaker is not one who plasters over a crack so that it does not show, nor one who takes the easy line of surface amiability. Peace is made by the love which builds up, and the metaphor is true whether we think of building up a damaged wall with new stones or building up the breach in an injured body with living tissue. If the picture which Isaiah calls up is the rebuilding of the broken city, it is because for him the material and the spiritual are parts of one whole. With such full-bodied thoughts would the word peacemakers have been filled in the mind of Jesus. Those who edify and love now are building for the house of God in his kingdom and are repairers of the breach. Their lives and influence are as constructive as those who live for strife and contention are destructive. And the construction is carried over into that kingdom where mere destructiveness will have no place. But in this and every other sense, the supreme peacemaker is the Son of God himself. And to him the word is applied in its only other occurrence in the New Testament, Colossians 1, verse 19 to 20. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace, or making peace, through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. He is our peace, and it is because he is the repairer of the breach that in him all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. And as he became the author of salvation, so also he became the author of peace and the prototype of all his brethren who are peacemakers, because in some tiny degree they reflect that quality in which he must forever be supreme. The fullest exposition of the Lord's thought is found in a passage in James, which, by a perversion which would be ludicrous were it not painful, is used more often than not to justify strife, First pure, 
then peaceable. Does not mean that peace is ended to, to be attained when opposition is crushed. The first is not a note of time, as though you could be pure this week and peaceable next, when the other people are eliminated. Such naive philosophy belongs not to Christ, but to Hitler, who at last could find only a barren peace in a suicide's death. He may be credited with having sincerely wanted peace, once all disagreement with him had been liquefied. Like most perversions of Scripture, this is made possible by quoting a fragment, a mere splinter, away from its context. For what James is saying is that peace comes from the pure heart, as strife comes from the impure. Bitter jealousy and faction, James says, has its source in a wisdom which does not come down from above. Its origin is earthly, its character is that of the human mind, and its outcome is a disorganization which, in the language of the time, could be called demon-like. For where jealousy and faction, or ambitious rivalry, are, there is confusion in every vital deed. With a little play upon the word demon-like, we may say, there is pandemonium. Here is a sad picture indeed of the working of the fleshly mind in the ecclesias, and it corresponds closely, especially when we read on to chapter 4, with the works of the flesh described in Galatians 5, verses 19 to 20. In contrast to this dark picture, James portrays the wisdom which has its origin from the Father of Lights. And so, to recall again Galatians 5, yields the fruit of the Spirit. Its prime quality from which all others follow is that it is pure. Once again James is more concerned with the thought than with the words of his Master. For he uses a different word for pure, not conveying the idea of cleansing or catharsis, but more nearly related to, though not identical with, the holiness or sanctification of Hebrews 12, verse 14. It denotes freedom from any kind of defilement, and is the positive side of keeping oneself unspotted from the world. The word may be used of merely ceremonial purity, but on the moral level it is the purity enjoined by Paul to Timothy. But James uses it of the perfect freedom from inward stain or blemish, which is also the meaning of John when he applies the word to the Son, who is the manifestation of the Father. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Peter, too, uses the verb in a passage which reflects the mind of the Lord and illuminates the language of James. Seeing ye have purified your souls in your obedience to the truth, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, love one another from the heart fervently. Those who obey that injunction will be peacemakers indeed. James crowns his thought with a manifold allusion to the sermon. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace, of them that make peace. The whole chapter, with its starting point in the warning against the ambition to be teachers, is parallel to the Lord's warning against false prophets who will bring destruction and confusion among the flock. In verses 11 to 12, James introduces two similes. The spring, which pours water out of the crevice, of the same kind as that which wells from the source deep in the ground, and the tree which bears fruit after its kind, and not after another kind. The latter is a favourite simile of the Lord's, which is first found in Matthew 7, verses 16 to 18. 
These two figures have remained in James' mind and coloured his choice of language. And now he returns to the tree as a metaphor. There is a tree which is righteousness, and righteousness is its fruit. The sowing of that fruit is an unobtrusive work, but it is done by the peacemakers who are pure in heart. The growth may be secret and unobserved, but the product in the end is trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. But there is a condition for this planting in which God works with and through men. It is done in peace, for strife is destructive of the very seed of righteousness. Nothing, however, could be further from the thought, either of Jesus or of James, than a mere tolerance of wrongdoing or wrong teaching. Their very object is to exhort to discrimination. Beware of false teachers, says Jesus, and the passage is the reverse side of the blessing on the peacemakers, for these are strife-makers and destroyers of life. You can distinguish them, he says, by what they produce. Beware of yourselves, says James. Do not all strive to be teachers. Discriminate between the sweet and the bitter that issues from your mouths. And if need be, change the source from the wisdom that is from beneath to the wisdom that is from above. Both Jesus and James grieve over conflicting teachings in the church and the contention which results, and both trace them to a moral rather than an intellectual source. The distortion begins in the heart before it is reflected in the mind. The root of heresy is in self-love, and who, looking over the sadly chequered history of the household of God, would venture to deny that the root cause of much of the wars and fightings has been emulation, envying, or, to put it bluntly, jealousy. We cannot be judges of the hearts of men, but we are called on to be judges of their fruits and of our own. Paul, too, mentions that which is bitter in a context concerned with purity and peace. The root of bitterness in Hebrews 12 verse 15 is an allusion to the root which beareth gall and wormwood. The man or family practising idolatry in Deuteronomy 29.18. That root is defiling, says Paul. Follow after peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no man shall see the Lord. The order is changed, but the idea is the same as in the Beatitudes. Clean, sanctified, purified. The terms vary, but the thought is one. The pure in heart shall see God, and they are the peacemakers.